How many here have looked over the covenant membership form? How many here need one this morning? Okay, can Bob, can whoever raises their hand, can you make sure they get one? Uh, Daryl and Lisa needs one. Jason needs one. Yeah, there's quite a few people here that could use one. I look back, and we actually started writing this thing back in 2017. And um, I sat down over a matter of several weeks and wrote this, and then uh, Jeff Trott, one of our elders, got involved in it, and we tweaked it a little bit, went back through it. And, uh, and even recently, there was another uh, time that we took and we went through it again a little bit. And, and again, we are presenting this to you. It's always been up on our church website. And again, I've never been against church membership. Um, please hear my heart. But the way that church membership happens in most places is not very biblical. Uh, people don't understand it. And so this document here is truly biblical. You'll see under all the things that we've listed here, there are scriptures that will reference this. And our hearts is, just like in any other thing that we do, whether it's teaching or not, is to be biblical. And so that's what we're planning to do. Uh, We are going to have a prayer time after service. So we are going to take prayer requests at the end of service. And then Lisa's probably not raising her hand very high because it's her birthday today, too, and we're going to sing happy birthday to Lisa. So she's trying to get out of it, so, but she's not going to. But uh, if you look at that covenant membership, if you have it with you, I want to go down to the second paragraph on the first page. It says this, Momentum Christian Church membership covenant is birthed out of our love for the church body and, it in, and the individual members who we hope will experience the fullness of joy which is found in the presence of the Lord. The primary purpose of this covenant is to serve as a teaching document with three functions. To clarify the biblical obligations and expectations for both the elders of Momentum Christian Church and the individual members of Momentum Christian Church body. It's to establish teaching and doctrinal parameters for the Momentum Christian Church body. And it's to serve as a tool for reflection and growth towards holiness. Each of these functions is in accordance with the document overall vision to provide an accessible explanation of the scriptures and hope that Momentum Christian Church would grow in the grace and the truth of Jesus Christ. And that is truly our heart here as elders here at Momentum Christian Church, is that we grow together in the grace and the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I am not going to preach on this line for line. That was not my intent. But I believe there's a couple things in here that I have to define, and it's important that we define. And what I want to talk about today is what is pastors slash elders? What are pastors slash elders? Now, I'm just going to give you a little bit of history about myself and Missy. We actually started ministry in the church that we grew up in. And that church at one time was a very tight-knit family church, actually taught very good family principles. That's what they were known for in the community. In fact, I remember on Wednesday nights, we used to show James Dobson's family, focus on the family, family films at a local junior high school where the attendance was just amazing who showed up for a midweek night. And in that church, um, as I, we grew up, we were married there, and I got involved in ministry, was preaching in the pulpit, and also teaching classes, and running different ministries in the church. Um, it was not an elder-led church. And what happened was this, it came to a point to where things, because of an affiliation with an organization that we had become partners with, some things started happening in the church that weren't quite biblical. And what I found out very quickly was the leadership there, because the leadership set up, you couldn't question authority. And if you questioned authority, you were a problem even if it was legitimate. 
The first time that I sat down with our pastor in a very respectful manner there, asking him why he was not keeping Scripture in context, it was that next Sunday that he got up in front of our congregation and announced to everybody that Dave Devlamic would no longer be preaching in the pulpit, would no longer be leading worship, would no longer be running classes in the church. And it was a shock to not only me and Missy, but also my family who attended there, and Missy's family that attended there, and of course many other people that flock. And it was just because I questioned. And it was through that I had a series of five other meetings with that pastor. And eventually, the last meeting we had with them, we simply told them that we felt that we needed to find a different church on biblical reasons, doctrinal reasons. And we left. And it wasn't with a blessing. In fact, we were pretty much told that we were in rebellion, even though every meeting I had with him was in a very respectful way. We did not uh, cause any riffles in that congregation as far as going to friends or other people in that congregation. But we were turned over to Satan. And it was, I'll tell you, for the first day and a half, pretty scary. And for years in our community, we would run into people from that church in the grocery store and they would run away from us. I actually made it into a game at one point, to where I would see them before they saw me, and I'd walk up on them, and I'd say hi, and then I would follow them through the store as they were trying to get away from the devil himself. And from that point on, I started doing some research and started looking at what it truly meant and how leadership should be structured in a church, and we Went from there and we started actually our first ministry in a church in Lapeer, Michigan. And we were there for about seven years and it was in that church that we had set up an elder board where they were more than just decision makers, but they were becoming quote slash elders slash pastor. And from that point on, every church that we had ever went to or God had moved us to which was seven years in one church, and it was another seven years in another church, and then he brought us here. We've been here for about 16 years, I think it's been now. Two of those years was with the previous church, Mountaintop Church. And it's always been an elder-led church. And the reason for that, I've had offers in other churches to go and pastor there, but again, because of their leadership structure, uh, we didn't even consider it. Because here, folks, I'm just going to explain this very clearly before I get into my notes. God, the unchanging God that we serve, and how many believe that God is unchanging, has given us an unchanging prescription or direction in the New Testament on how church should be operated. Everybody agree with me? And that is, again, elders slash pastors slash deacons. And in our church here, we have many deacons. Many of you serve in the church. And so God, the God that does not change, His Word that does not change, has given us that instructions. And again, I grew up in a church that didn't follow that instructions. And again, it's sad to see the state of that church today. It's sad to see where that organization is today. And so when we, again, and Bob Siebert will be able to attest to this because he was the only elder here still, and Bob was an elder here from Momentum. Uh, it was 2020 that Bob stepped away after serving many years in churches as an elder. But Bob will tell you that when I came to Mountaintop Church, Within the matter of the first month, I'd realized that, boy, we weren't an elder-led church. And Bob will recall this meeting where we sat everybody down, and I simply asked all the elders in a meeting, 
with the pastor there, so what do you do in the church? And I remember Bob telling me when I asked him, I take care of the grounds. And then I remember I asked another elder in the church, and, and they told me, well, I take in care of the things inside the building. And, and I, as I continued to ask them what they did, by the time we were all done, I looked at them all, and I said, listen, you're all deacons. Man, I don't know if this is an elder-led church. And at that time, there really wasn't much prayer going on amongst the elders. Again, there was a pastor that was making most of the decisions and at times even going over the board's decision that was being made. He would change those decisions after the board had made those decisions. So from that point on, we truly started looking and seeing what does it look like to be an elder-led church? And so we see this model, it begins in Acts, Acts chapter 6. And again, I want to remind you of something that that term pastor slash elder is the same word in the Greek. So the elders in this church, we consider them pastors. Pastor slash elders. You need to keep that in your mind. But in Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 4, Acts 6, 1 through 4, it says this. Now in, the day, in these days, when the disciples were increasing in numbers, a complaint came from the Hellenists, and it arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distrib distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God and to serve the tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out of you among you seven men of good repute, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, who we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. And so we have this issue here in Acts chapter 6, after the church is birthed in the New Testament, that the apostles, the disciples, the apostles, found themselves with some issues going on in the church and as it started to grow. And these issues, again, were about these widows that were not receiving food distribution. And we see at this point that the apostles say, listen, we recognize that our main position in the church, what God has called us to is to be men of prayer and men of the word. We see the first deacon ministry made here. And we know that one of those deacons, of course, as you read through Acts, was Stephen, who ends up being the first martyr in the church that we know. My heart today is simply to go through what are pastors slash elders called to do in the church, but also to let you know, too, that the Bible gives us clear guidelines on what they should be. And I can assure you that each elder here, as they were prayed about, as they were selected, as people uh, in encouraged us to look at them, or uh, that they've all went through this process. We do not take this process lightly here at Momentum Christian Church. The elders here at Momentum are not voted in. Again, we are not a voting membership. That is something that you don't see in Scripture. I know that many of you and some of you have been part of a voting membership. We don't see that in Scripture. And it's probably a good thing. It's probably a, a good thing because how many of you have ever been involved in a voting membership where you just have seen things completely go sideways because a majority of the church wants something that necessarily isn't biblical. I think of a friend named Artie that I know from up north who pastored a congregational church for 14 years and because he was preaching about homosexuality, they got just 5% enough to vote him out as pastor. And they are still without a pastor till this day. And they're actually working now with a Mormon church. So we see voting membership is not a biblical thing. 
So what are pastors and elders called to do? Those who find themselves in the position of elder and pastor within the local church have been given a great responsibility. And because it's such a great responsibility, God has given us instructions and clear instructions of what that responsibility should look like and how it should be carried out. I want you to turn to 1 Peter. 1 Peter. We're going to look at 1 Peter chapter 5, the first four verses. We're going to see the instructions that God has given pastors slash elders in the church. Verse 1, it says this, So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness. Now remember, Paul is the one who's writing this. And a witness of the suffering of Christ as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you. Exercising oversight, not under compulsion, which that word compulsion means by force, but willingly, as God would have you. Not for the shameful gain, but eagerly. Not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And When the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. So we see here that God has given us very clear instructions on what it looks like to be those that teach and care for the flock that God has entrusted to us as pastors and elders here at Momentum Christian Church. Peter writes to these churches, and they're enduring at this time great suffering. And he tells the elders among the people that they must shepherd the people and also exercise oversight and that they must be an example to the flock. Now this word here in verse 2, the word shepherd, is a verb. And it means this, again, elders, pastors, that they're not just called elders, pastors by name, but they must be doing the work of pastoring and shepherding. It's just not a title, folks. It's just not a position here at the church, and it's so important. Listen, elders that are here today, that we understand this. This is just not a title. We must be doing the work that God has called us to. Shepherding. We must be men of prayer. We must be men of the Word. We must be men that are able to teach the Word of God, and we must be examples to the congregation. And why has God given us these gifts, just like He's given all of you gifts, to strengthen this body of believers here at Momentum Christian Church? We are called to nurture. We are called to protect. We are called to strengthen the flock by teaching sound doctrine and sound teaching. We're called to look outside and determine dangers that might be close at hand. How many know that Satan, he just loves tearing apart flocks and congregations. And he's ready to do it at any moment. But also in this text, Peter also gives the elders and pastors instructions on how to carry out shepherding and oversight. He doesn't leave us lost in wondering how we should do that. But he gives us clear direction. It's a job that should be done willingly, eagerly. It should be a position that brings joy. It should be a position that causes us to be stretched in our giftings. It's a position that calls for us to love the congregation. And of course, to have a love for Jesus Christ. Pastor elders here today, listen, God can give you a supernatural love. And that's what we need to ask Him for. Throughout my years of pastoring, shepherding, I can tell you this, and I have been on elder boards in the churches that I've been a part of, just like I am now. I am one of the elders 
I can tell you this, that there's times I've run into some very difficult people. People that after every service make it a point to say to me, I do not like you. I'm telling you the truth. That, that has happened. And I've prayed and asked God to give me a supernatural love for them, and guess what? God has honored that. He is, again, because it lines up with His will, to love them in a caring way. And sometimes I've had to speak words, but it's always been in love. To encourage them. We're to be those that have a supernatural love that only comes from Jesus Christ Himself, that comes from the Holy Spirit that lives and resides in each and every one of us. We're also told here in this text that this responsibility should not be carried out for personal gain. Now, you need to hear me on this because some of you will say, well, Pastor Dave, don't you take any income from the church? There is nothing wrong with a pastor being paid. And I will say this, there's nothing wrong with a pastor being paid well enough to provide for his family. Because I'm just going to be honest with you, Many churches, that does not happen. Throughout working with different ministries and the pastorate, right now I'm, I'm working with pastors in the outdoors, I cannot tell you how many guys come to those retreats because somebody blessed them and paid for them to be there who are not able to make a living. Because some church bodies believe that they have to keep their pastor humble. Some people believe that, again, that it'll, it'll cause him and his wife to always be constantly crying out to God. I can tell you this, those are the wrong reasons. Now, is there people that are in ministry for gain? All you have to do is go on the internet and you'll find out that that is a fact and that is true. But I can tell you this, most pastors that I know are not in it for gain. Most pastors I know that are in it, it's not about the money, but it's about the calling that God has put upon them. But Peter makes it clear that we should not do it for gain. And we're going to look at some scriptures later on that's going to spell it out clearly that pastors should be paid. And what scripture says about it. But we see Peter also tells the elders in this portion of scripture that we looked at that they... Uh, again, must not exercise this responsibility in a domineering fashion. And it's that word and compulsion. It's by force. This can be very abusive, and it's against God's word. Listen, the only power I have here as pastor, the only power that the elders have here at Momentum Christian Church as elders slash pastors is the word of God. That is our authority. That is the power that we've been entrusted with. And it's God's power. And so, listen, if anybody here ever suffers under the hand of an elder or pastor that you feel like you're being domineered over, or you're being pushed into something that you shouldn't do, or they're giving you bad counsel on how to live out your household, you need to get a hold of an elder here in the church so we can faithfully deal with that. Again, the church that we grew up with, they would tell people, if you drink coffee, you don't love the Lord, and everybody stopped drinking coffee. Remember when they went through a step? My, my, my parents did. They just did it behind closed doors. Remember everybody being told they can't have Anything that was pork, it didn't stop the ham coming to our Easter table. But we didn't let everybody know about it either. That is in a domineering fashion. I often wonder today, I know it's not a common thing, but people just don't have pastors over to their home anymore. And I kind of wonder, is it because you think we're going to go through your bookshelves? Your medicine cabinets. 
Listen, God has not called us to that. God has called us to be men of prayer and men that can faithfully bring forth the word of God. Because how many of you know that it's the word of God that brings power? It's the word of God that brings change in our life to one that's filled with the Holy Spirit. Again, man that's not born again, the word of God is just foolishness to them. But for us that are born again, it's life. It's what causes us to, again, to be able to see and have that, that wickedness and the good in our hearts divided by the Holy Spirit. So we cannot do this position in a domineering fashion. We cannot shepherd that way. We are called to be humble. And we're called to be an example to the flock. Does it mean that we're perfect? No. Nope. Can I get an amen? Many of you have encountered an imperfect elder slash pastor here in this church. We do make mistakes. But do we repent? Or do we recover? Do we ask forgiveness? I believe that we have. And I believe that we'll continue to do that. Many of you know that when you parent, that oftentimes you have to go back and apologize to your children, don't you? And how many know that your children are not all the same? I think of my brother John, who has, was it four daughters? Those four daughters are all different, aren't they? Yeah, each one of them are different. Just like my two girls, even though they're both girls, both very different. And then my son was, of course, different in many different ways. And, and so are all the people in the church. One thing we have in common is, again, the Holy Spirit that resides in each and every one of us. And Jesus Christ, our Lord, our King. As elders, pastors, we need to always, always understand that we are under the shepherd. Jesus Christ is under shepherds. This is His church. I hate it when people refer to it as Pastor Dave's church. I have found myself not even saying the words our church because this is not my church. This is Jesus Christ's church. As God placed me here as the teaching elder shepherd, he has, and I have no doubt of that. But again, we must understand that we are under shepherds. And we have to look to Him for everything for this congregation and for this flock, for us to be good under shepherds. So we've seen so far that we're called to be shepherds or under shepherds under the chief shepherd. We've seen that pastor elders are to feed the flock, the flock. And again, it's my job to feed this flock here, this local flock at Momentum Christian Church. Are there times and have there been times that I've been given the opportunity to go and teach at another church? Of course. And overseas, of course. But again, my main position, my shepherding takes place here at Momentum Christian Church. And again, when I refer to Momentum Christian Church, I'm hoping that you're not seeing this building as the church because you are Momentum Christian Church. We are a local body here, part of a bigger, part, a bigger body, a bigger church. And again, uh, we can never forget the idea of the world view of the church because I can tell you this, is. Dark as things are looking at times, there is still a remnant. There is still good churches. There still are good pastors, good elders that are teaching every Sunday. So let us never lose sight of that. As pastor shepherds, we are not called. I'm going to give you some things that we're not called to. We are not called to win over our neighborhoods even though that should be happening of the outpouring and the correct teaching that's happening in this church. But I am not called to do that. Some of you here, you might be called to do that. 
In fact, I believe that we all are, and that's why often I pray, let us not just leave what we received here, but let it go with us to the restaurants, to the store, to our neighborhoods. Can you imagine if I were to take 95% of my time just evangelism, in evangelism? You wouldn't have a very good message every Sunday. You wouldn't have a pastor shepherd that would be praying for you like he should. The pastor elders wouldn't be the guys that would be there when loved ones passed or at the hospital. I'd be too busy getting blow-ups and hot dogs on the grill and trying to do that stuff in our back parking lot. But I believe that we should reach our neighborhood here because of the body here at Momentum Christian Church. We're not called to change the culture. We're not called to change the culture. We're not called to politics unless they interfere in God's Word. I've had some people say I'm too politically moved. The only time I mention politics here in this pulpit is when it comes against the church. Again, I will never be afraid to confront them with the Word of God when they come against the Word of God. Again, the end of this month, two bill goes in place that's going to affect most pastors in the pulpit. I'm prepared to pay fines. I'm prepared to do whatever God would have me to do after March 31st. If it confronts us, and it confronts the Word of God, we will stand on a hill, and we will get bloody. We are not called to social justice, Because there's only one true justice. And that justice comes from God Almighty. We're not called to the world, but also we're called to the saints, the pastor elders of this church. This does not mean, listen, please don't hear this wrong. I still evangelize. I still reach out to unbelievers all the time. Because God has allowed me to be a tent maker, bivocational, I interact with people constantly sharing Christ with them. But our focus here for this church body, again, is for you. And this is why we don't, and again, please, if you're new here, I'm going to explain something. When we dim the lights here, it's because these lights were giving people in this congregation migraines. If you look up right now, you'll see almost all the bulbs are out of these lights, but two. We got duped by a company when we built this building. So even now, we've taken out these light bulbs. Even when people stand, we still have people that get migraine headaches. And so therefore, we dim the lights when we stand, turn them back on. We Listen, it's not about setting the mood. And I talked to somebody yesterday at men's breakfast. They actually said, you know what? I could probably fix all this lighting for you for, what was it, under $400, I think he said to where it wouldn't be blinding people. Listen, we're never going to have smoke machines here. <laughs> Pyrotechnics. So, I know, Tim, you're just, I know you're not. You're just messing around. We are not here on our Sunday service to attract the world. The only way that we hope to attract the world is what Scripture tells us is by the love that they see inside this body of believers. And I have preached that for 14 years, how important that love is. Because that makes a difference. We have an opportunity this week, and again, we will get those arrangements out to you. We have the opportunity. Listen, more than likely that service is going to be Wednesday night, and I'm good with that because, again, I want to do and bless the family any way we can. So we're probably not going to be here Wednesday night, but you know what? Let's all go to the funeral home. Let's take time out to show our love and our remembrance of Debbie. But again, you know what that does to the unbelievers that are there at that funeral home? 
Wednesday night? Who are all these people? How did you know my mom? How did you know my aunt? She went to our church and we loved her. I, I think everybody here loved Debbie. Strongest lady I've ever seen walk that walk. I've never seen the peace of the Holy Spirit upon somebody like that. And I don't say that lightly. I'll share more about that at her service. But you know what that speaks? You know what it's going to speak when, when we have the service here to celebrate Kim Patangelo's life, when the church all shows up? It speaks volumes. You know how it speaks volumes when you hear and you share with somebody in the world that don't know Christ and you say, man, when I was out of a job, the church showered me with gifts. The believers in the body of Christ showered me with gifts. It's our love that's going to draw the world, the Word of God says. So we are going to always gear this Sunday morning towards you, the saints of God. We're not going to have messages that have no Scripture in them. And that does happen, folks. I don't think you realize there's churches within a drive from here that they have messages with no Scripture. Because it might be offensive. There's churches. Rick Warren will not sing or allow the blood of Christ to be sung about in his church no more because it's offensive to people. We are not here to draw the world except by the love of Jesus Christ. Now again, we hope that unbelievers come to this body believers because how do people get saved? Through the Word, by hearing the Word, right? So again, the Word has the power to do transformation. That's how each and every one of us were born again. It was by hearing the Word. And so, listen, I, I hope that unbelievers stumble in here, and we're going to welcome them, and we're going to pray that the Word of God does its perfect work in their life. But how many know the Word of God doesn't need pyrotechnics? Technics. The, the Word of God doesn't need smoke machines. The Word of God doesn't need uh, uh, singing songs that get us into a trance. Are you ready about to do anything or, or have altar calls? Have you ever been in these churches that have altar calls and they'll say, I know there's someone out there. And they play that song over 15, 20 times and finally somebody gives in. It's like, if, they, if I don't go up there, this service isn't going to stop. Somebody gives in and goes up front. So who are we called to? We're called to the redeemed. We are called to God's people. We're called to God's elect, Scripture says. And we are called to protect the flock. God will hold each and every one of us that are elders slash pastors here accountable for how we take care of this flock. You've heard me say this many times. I fear God more than you. None of you scare me. You know what scares me? Standing before God with a healthy fear of how this flock was shepherded. In Hebrews 13, 17, it says this. Hebrews 13, 17. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. Listen, I love what God has me doing. I've always loved the pastorate. Has there been times that I've inwardly doubted myself? Yeah. Has there been times where, boy, I just, again, because the enemy 
started speaking words to me that maybe I just need to put my hands down and quit. If anyone can tell you that, it would be my wife, Missy, and she probably can't tell you how many times she's prayed with me over that. But I know that God has called me here to Momentum Christian Church. The average in the day that we're living in, pastors usually serve in a church for two and a half years. And that's it. They move on. Now again, we're never going to be in a church crisis because how many know that the church of Jesus Christ, even the gates of hell can't prevail against it. But what God is doing in the day that we're living in is shaking and again is making it clear that there's some churches that don't even know him. We've seen that in our study in Revelation. Church of Laodicea, I stand at the door and knock. Jesus was not in that church. There was no believers in that church. Every other church in those seven, he always addressed to the faithful few. He encouraged the faithful few that were in that church, except for that church. And he said, nobody's there. I'm outside the door. Again, I'll make it easy for you to understand. Uh, today, I might be the last person in this building. We've got youth group tonight, so usually uh, we got an elders meeting, so I'm going to go right from this to an elders meeting to youth group and pray for me playing whirly ball if I get in one of those cars. Because as old as I am, that can be rough on your body. But if I'm the last one here, God leaves when I walk out that door. Because again, God resides in us. It's not, Momentum Christian Church is not this building, it's you. The people that are sitting in those seats. It says here, obey your leaders and submit to them. Whoa, that word submit. We don't like that in Detroit and Michigan where we're all unionized. Please hear me right. I was in the union for years. Not in it anymore and I'm grateful for that. Uh, for several personal reasons. But that word submit there, I'm going to make this simple for you. I often use this in counseling. The Bible also tells wives to submit to their husbands. Ooh, we don't like that word. I tell wives this, if your husband's beating you, I don't want you to submit to your husband. I want to make sure that you're safe. I want to get you to safety. If your church leaders are abusing you, you're not called to submit. This, is, this word submit here is a, an idea of respect. This idea of respect because of the reaction of the leader it should cause our response to be one, to understand that they are here for our benefit, they're here for our good. So it says, obey your leaders and submit to them, for they're keeping watch over your souls. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about this when we talk about membership. We're called to shepherd the flock here, but you know how hard it is when you only come here once a month? It makes me get on the phone. Because again, faithfully, if I don't see you here but once a month, for one thing, how are you getting fed? How are you being protected? And how in the world can anybody here, myself and the elders, shepherd you? It makes it awful tough. Elders, we need to be doing this with joy. and Not groaning. I can't tell you how many pastors' meetings I've been at where pastors often just dislike their flocks. Usually you find out that these guys weren't called to it. Often these are the guys that say, well, my mom thought it would be a good idea if I was a pastor. Because again, pastor, elder, it's a calling. It's not just something we decide to do for a living. And I, I wouldn't recommend it <laughs> if you're doing it for a living. Um, 
you have to be called or you will not sustain. Listen, the newest, newest polls, I just looked them up last night. This year, 50% of pastors will consider leaving the ministry in the United States. Last year, 39% left the ministry. And I personally know a few that did. 39% left. We must do it with joy. I can say this from the bottom of my heart. I love each and every one of you, and it's a joy to be your pastor. Now, there's times, listen, my wife, she's going to laugh about this. She often looks at me and says, aren't you going to smile? And I'll say to her, I'm, I'm, I'm good, I'm happy. Well, your face doesn't show it. Remember once we were in a store and we were purchasing something for Missy and the guy at the counter actually says, does your husband always look so angry? And I looked at the guy, I was like, I'm not angry. <laughs> I'm thinking. <laughs> I'm good. So please don't take it if I'm in one of those thinking phases that I'm upset or angry. That word joy there, we're to do it with joy means simply this, calm and with delight. That word murmur there means to sigh. Oh man, those people have momentum. I can't believe I got to go there again. Listen, this pastor doesn't do that. As the pastor here, I love our church. I love teaching the Word of God. I love studying the Word of God. Some of you that are teachers here, you know what I'm talking about. There's no greater joy than studying the Word. I have been called, just like the other elders here, and gifted by God to do what He's called me to do. Again, once in a while, I need the reminder of this. You go in my office on my wall, Missy bought me a sign that is laser cut out of steel that reads, you were built for this. It hangs in my office wall there because once in a while I need to look at that and be reminded of that. God has prepared me and the other elders in this church. He's allowed us to study and teach His Word. He's given us a supernatural love to love the sheep here, the congregation, even at times when they don't love us. He's given us discernment to protect the flock from false teachers and false teachings. And this responsibility we do not take lightly. This is why we offer classes on Wednesday night. Any of you that come out to Wednesday night, you know exactly what we're talking about. We are showing you in depth the false teachings out there that are so subtle, like the little God doctrine. I can guarantee you, some of you, I pray this isn't true, are watching teachers that believe in this stuff. Men like Stephen Furtick is preaching a different gospel. Oh, I know, he can get a crowd going but he doesn't believe in the Trinity, folks. He believes in the little God doctrine. He declares it in his teaching. But my prayer is that the Holy Spirit shows you. And this is so much harder in the day that we're living in because you can all leave here and click on any link that you want, even on your smartphone. Often when I'm traveling, I put on a message and I'll listen to teachers as I'm driving. Teachers that I know that are teaching the Word of God. But there's a lot of people that aren't. A lot of people that, again, have compromised God's Word. This idea of shepherding, and I'm just going to give you the verses here. In John chapter 10, 11 through 15, we see what Jesus has to say about it. 
You know, one thing that I want to point out is that he says that he's willing to lay down his life for the sheep. Elders, pastors, we need to be those men that are willing to lay down our lives for the sheep. What does that look like? It means understanding that you have been given and been gifted by God to give of your time to somebody that needs to listen. You've been gifted and given the ability to teach. Listen, being elders and the idea, and we're going to look at the idea of what God calls elders to do, one of those things is teaching. That doesn't always take place here in this pulpit. That word teaching there means that they have the ability to do it one-on-one if needed. To give sound, biblical biblical um, encouragement. But we must be willing to lay down our lives for the sheep here at Momentum. I want to look real quick at the qualifications. Turn to Titus chapter 1. What does God say that elders should be? What are these qualifications? And again, we take these qualifications right out of the Word of God. We don't make them up. And we hold tight to these principles, these qualifications here at Momentum. We take them serious. Again, as a member of this congregation, if you see our elders in any way failing or faulting or sinning, In any of these qualifications, you need to come and get a hold of an elder, get a hold of a pastor. In 1 Titus 5-9, through it says this, This is why I left you in Crete, so that you might might put what remained into order, and appoint elders in every town. Now the church is growing at this point. Of course, it's more than just the apostles, so they're appointing shepherds, pastor, elders in all these new churches that have grown and have been planted. I direct you, in verse 6 it says this, if anyone is above reproach, so an elder has to be above reproach, pastor has to be above reproach, the husband of one wife, you hear that? A husband of one wife. Now listen, here at Momentum Christian Church, we believe what God's Word says. We Don't believe that God has called women to the pastorate. His word makes that clear. It does not say a woman of one husband. God has gifted people. It does not mean, and in our constitution here, in our covenant here, you'll see that we believe that women and men are equal. But God has given us different callings in different areas. I will never be a mother. We just got baby chickens this last week. And of course, any of you that ever got baby chickens, we're getting them for eggs. We put them in a big container in our very back room, trying to make my best to make sure everything's clean there. And I'm convinced between me and our dog, they're going to think that one of us is their mom. I'm tending to think it's our Bernadoodle because she's got her head inside that constantly. She's sleeping there at night now. But as weird as that is, my dog's not a chicken. As weird as it might seem, and our world is trying to tell people, a man will never be a mother. Mother will will never be a father. sad state of our world is that often it seems like they have to fill that role. I think of the children of Israel. There was 12 tribes, and how many know that there was one tribe that was called to be the priest? What tribe was that? Levites, right? Do you think that God loved the Levites any more than he did any other tribe? Not at all but God called them to a specific role. Qualifications, as we continue here, it says this. Husband of one wife and his children are believers. 
and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. For an overseer as God's steward must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or drunkard or violent or greedy to gain. He must be hospitable, a lover of good, must be self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. We also see qualifications in 1 Timothy 3, 1-8. 1 Timothy 3, 1-8. It says this, The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money, He must manage his own household well with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he he may be puffed up with conceit and fall into condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders, so that he may not fall into disgrace and to the snare of the devil. So we're given these qualifications. I'm going to take five more minutes this morning. You see that first qualification is he must be one that aspires. And that word aspire there means in the Greek, desired. He must be willing to be stretched, it also means there. Desired to be stretched is the Greek word there in aspire. To the office of overseer, he desires is a noble task. Again, this aspiring, he must, again, want to. That God will put something in them to say, yes, I believe that God has called me to this, to be uh, elder, overseer, pastor, shepherd. Again, my calling did not come to me because my mom said, I think it'd be good if you were a pastor. Many of you have heard my testimony and how God called me in the ministry. I was actually running from him, and he used a big stick to get my attention. It says, the husband of one wife. Again, this phrase here means, in the Greek, a one-woman man. Now again, Let me just be clear on this. He is not applying anything particular about past divorce. He's not applying uh, someone that is a widower. He's not applying to someone that's single. Both Timothy and Paul likely were unmarried at this point. The point that's being made here is that the elder must not be known for marital immorality. And this means either being celibate or single, but they have to be demonstrating a faithful relationship with their wife. Then we're given this other qualification, being sober-minded. Again, sober-mindedness here is not a reference to being drunken or being in drunkenness, but it's about being level-headed, being alert. And you can find that in 1 Timothy 3.3. 3. 1 Timothy 3.3. 3. Another qualification is he must be self-controlled. And we know this, that this is one of the fruit of the Spirit. This is a fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5, 23. And it's expected by all believers, but an elder slash pastor must be exhibiting it, must 
It must be shown. It must be lived out. Another qualification is you must be respectable. Respectable. And this idea of respectable in the Greek means it must be modest. And this is the idea of not being a boastful person. A boastful person. So tonight at youth group, hold me accountable. Got to be hospitable, it says. And that word hospitable means this, one who loves guests. And in this culture that they were living in, this was huge, this was important. In this culture, many of these pastors, elders, actually hosted churches in their homes. Must be able to teach. And this word there, able to teach, in the Greek it means this, must be able to relate to the ability and communicate biblical truths. Not only from this pulpit, but on -on one-on-one conversations. Romans 12.2 says this. Romans 12.2 says this. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. And by testing, you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Through that verse in there, because elders, I believe that we need to, again, keep this verse tight to our hearts, that we are not to be conformed by this world. We need to be men that are swimming upstream against what our world, against where we see so many false movements turning towards. We must not conform. 2 Timothy 4, 1-2, through it says this, I charge you in the presence of God and Jesus Christ to who is the judge of the living and the dead and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with complete patience and teaching. Again, elders, we must be men that are able to teach, and we must do it in a way that we are patient. We're not called to be a drunkard. Again, we've taught this here at Momentum. We are not legalists. How many know that drinking wine in this day was a big part of the culture? So this is not talking about taking a drink. I've said this many times. If you ever go golfing with me and you want to get a beer and a burger, I'm good with that. Just don't have five or six of them. Because then lovingly, I'm going to have a talk with you. But this is not the idea that elders cannot drink but they cannot be drunkards. They're called not to be violent and strikers, but they're called to be gentle. Missy will tell you there's been a few times where I've had to sit there, whether it be in church settings or in settings outside the church where I'll have to say to myself, you're not a striker. You cannot be a striker. This does not mean that I cannot self-defend myself, so don't try me at the door. Why do I do that? Because now some of you are going to. But I'm called not to be a striker. I'm called to be gentle. Called not to be quarrelsome. Again, we're not called to be argumentative or temporal. We are called to be those that listen and are gentle, that are humble when interacting with the sheep. The Greek term there implies that we are to be patient and fair-minded. We're called not to be lovers of money. Listen, I've said this in the past. You want to see who are false teachers? Look up and see how much they're worth. That should tell you the story. But remember, I'm a rich man. There's nothing wrong with wealth, folks. Please hear me this morning. In our teaching in Sunday school this morning, the teacher, Stephen Armstrong, actually brought that up, didn't he? For you that were sitting in that class. 
God blesses some people with wealth to bless the kingdom of God. To bless the kingdom of God. So please, listen, I have no problem if you're wealthy. It's the love of money that is the issue, that is the root cause here. Again, in the Philippines, I'm a rich man driving that 2007 GMC Yukon. That makes me a rich man in India. I try to keep a worldview looking at these things. I'm going to have to bring this up next week, the rest of this. I have a couple more pages of notes here, and I think it's important. Um, we will make it through it. Um, the good thing is next week, you all get to go have lunch after I'm done. So right now, you just get to get some great snacks and some coffee out there. But listen, my heart is, again, to show you what the Bible says that elders, pastors are to what God has called us to. And listen, I mean this in all seriousness. If there's an elder or pastor in this church that are not following those qualifications, you need to let someone know. Our last elder that we brought on to this church, I actually called their employer. How are they at work? What is their lifestyle? How's, how's their speech? Are they respectful? Because how many know behind the scenes you can act different at times, but that will catch up with you. That will catch up with you. Nothing hidden will be left hidden. Nothing in the dark will remain in the dark. Why don't you stand with me and we'll stretch during our prayer time here.